Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about fundraising for performing arts organizations during COVID with guests. Dale Hedding, Vice President of Development with Chicago Symphony Orchestra, and Danielle Saint Germain Gordon, Chief Development Officer at San Francisco Ballet. So thank you for joining us. This is great to have you both here and to talk about fundraising for performing arts. We're, we're in challenging times, challenging times. Thank you for, for sharing your experience with us today. Great to be here. Really fun to be here at eight o'clock in the morning. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> at 8 o'clock in the morning and 11 o'clock for you, Dale. Dale, why don't we start uh, for you since you've had a little bit more time to uh, have your coffee. That's um, right. and let's, let's talk about what you're experiencing during this really challenging time for the performing arts uh, in Chicago. Sure. And, you know, it's certainly been uh, several months of constant uh, transition, adjustments. Uh, you know, I think so many of us probably assumed we were in it for just a few months when we started and a few months more. And then we thought we'd survive the summer. Um, now it appears we're in it for a while. And you know that has caused tremendous upheaval in a lot of major performing arts organizations, particularly deciding you know, at what point do you toggle between live performances, small audiences, or now none, because we can't. Um, and, and how do you respond to that? So I would say in Chicago, we've, we jumped very early on um, into a direction we've been meaning to go for a while, which is to start getting much more engaged in the virtual world and providing our performances, but particularly our community education outreach programs virtually to schools and other communities. So this just really accelerated that process for us. So as we go on through the conversation, I'll, I'll share a few things, particularly as they pertain to fundraising. But I would say in Chicago, we have been in a very rapid plan, replan, replan mode adjustments um, program, then reprogram what we programmed. But the point is we've been getting, we've been getting content in performances and education material out in the community this whole time from scrappy in someone's kitchen to now it's much more professionally produced. So yeah, I think we're just all evolving quickly. And that's been our story here in Chicago. What Dale is talking about, this whole idea of trying to reshape a classic arts organization for the modern world is very much on everyone's mind. And Danielle, you're also ensconced in this whole transformation, aren't you? Oh, indeed. So I arrived just about two and a half years ago and I'd spent my life in the world of theater. I had come from the Guthrie Theater and prior to that, the Arena Stage in Washington, DC and the Shakespeare Theater. So you and, know drama. Pardon me? You know drama. Oh, I sure do. <laughs> and this has been the year of it, hasn't it? And so I arrived and then shortly after um, my arrival within uh, not too long, pardon me, <clears throat> Glenn McCoy, our lovely executive director decided that it was time for him to move to Sonoma and grow tomatoes. Um, but talk about cataclysmic change. So we were able to recruit, actually you recruited uh, or you, you placed Kelly Tweedale as executive director. So she arrived last September and everything felt just great, right? So September comes, Nutcracker comes, there was a moment in February that in our neighborhood in San Francisco, the entire power grid went out and it was one evening's performance. And there were probably you know 2,500 people in the house. And I remember that night, all of us gathering to say, what are we going to do? How do we, all the money we're going to lose from these tickets and how do we fill these people? How do we get them back into the, the performance? Only did we know, you know, three weeks later, our season ended on March 6th, which was opening night and closing night of A Midsummer Night's Dream. So it's been, um, for those of us who love change, this has been a thrilling year. For those who don't, um, I think it's been the opposite. So how do we, um, we move forward? Because I, I believe, and I'm really interested to, to hear how you're experiencing this, I believe that this is a moment where everything is coming together to say, if you haven't been listening about the need for change, we've got your attention now. You know, I feel, I feel like, you know, the universe is whispering in our, in our ear, but, but at a considerable volume, how do we adjust? And, and we, we've talked a little bit, Dale, you were indicating the, this sort of online thing. Let's talk a little bit about how you're adjusting in both the short term, but also on a sustained basis so that you have audiences and that you're able to monetize that attention and support of the arts so that it's sustainable. 
Yeah, so look, one, one of the core tenets of any great fundraising program, of course, is communication, but engagement with patrons. And I think over the last several years, one of the things that's happening in successful programs is they are spending a lot more time explaining to donors what the organization does, how it operates, basically what we do with your very generous support. And who is the donor? Who, when you say donor, who is the donor? Is it a small group? Is it a large group? Is it a is it is it large? Is it, are you just talking about major gifts people, or are you talking? No, I, I, about I'm donors? talking about all the way across the board. Uh, large donors, small donors. You know, we emphasize we spend a lot more time with large, major donors, of course. But it's patrons, people that we expect and hope to be donors uh, in the coming seasons. So yeah, I think that is, that should be what successful programs are doing these days. So that became absolutely you know a life saving tool during during the pandemic here you know we very early on by the summer we were starting to organize a, a large series of zoom conversations with donors with the president and the chairman of the board with major donors and our campaign donors with staff with musicians with with more medium-sized donor groups but the point was we were trying to get information in front of the patrons and donors often um, and back then it was critical. They, nobody knew, are you paying musicians or not? Are you canceling? How are staff doing? What's going on? So yeah, we, we just immediately went to a mode of delivering messaging in all kinds of crazy ways, um, including starting to do these musician driven performances from their kitchens. I mean, just 10 minutes, we've got that one great video of one of our violinists is a new mom with baby on her back and the little baby sack playing a quartet herself with the baby feeding the baby in between pieces. It was really, you know, that kind of stuff is really endearing. And that was a standard for a while. You just got something out and you stayed in your people's lives. And now, of course, the expectations have gone up. People expect it to be more polished, a little more, you know, serious. And so it's, it's been, you know, I think we jumped early on. And that's why even with that terrible year, um, we closed June, you know, we thought we'd be four or $5 million under our $25 million annual fund goal. We actually hit the goal and we had 3000 more donors households than we did the year before, because we were already on this path when the pandemic hit, but we just accelerated that communication when, once we got going and, and well, in a little bit, we can talk more about what we're doing now in the fall, but that's, I'll, I'll start the conversation with that. Well, that's so wonderful. And, and Danielle, when, when you and I were interacting um, initially before you even came on, you were talking about blurring the lines between marketing, the connection with, with the audience and development. Um, has that continued this, this whole idea that everybody who is a patron is a donor, everybody who's a potential patron is also part of that, that whole circle? Yeah, it sure has. It's actually been super fun. So we, uh, going back to March, it feels like walk down memory lane. So we, we lose our season March 6th. My, um, to be successful in these times, you need a number of things, but the top three for me are a capable, resilient, responsive team, a board that says there's the horizon race for it and leadership that trusts you, right? So I had the trifecta completely in this moment. So on March 25th, so it was, but 19 days after we lost our season, we had a complete new micro site up and we branded it the Critical Relief Fund. And there was a moment in a staff meeting, a small group where we were talking about like how much, and we figured back a napkin, we were gonna lose probably $10 million. It was 60% of our season. So I'm like, you know, I think, it, I think we can raise five. That's it. So all of a sudden five was the budget. We were gonna raise $5 million by June 30th. So I'm very, very pleased to announce that we raised 5 million by July 16th. So we were a little late, 16 days late, but we hit, uh, we crested $5 million. And from that, from that moment, we decided that there's a patron uh, and the spends to the ballet is what matters. It's not if it's a tax deductible gift or a two box seats on a Saturday night. So we've chosen to go down that path. Um, this fall, for example, when we announced that our season was going digital, we scheduled two town hall meetings. And the criteria for the first one was donors above 25,000 or subscribers with a spend of 5,000 or more because we can speak to them because that's a huge investment. And we're finding from those conversations, we then announced digital, almost 80% of subscribers to date 
have donated their tickets back. So all of a sudden we're talking to them from the very patron centric thing. And all of us in the performing arts or in you know, performing arts, maybe, maybe everywhere, we know that marketing and development, that can be a tenuous thing. Like who's in the front seat? And right now it feels particularly good. I was, uh, I was standing in Kansas City with um, someone who was running a, a performing arts organization. And we were watching school kids, young school kids holding hands, walking in to the theater. And he just smiled, leaned back and he said, ah, future patrons. And I said, really? He said, yeah, and future donors. He said, love starts here. And, and how, do you, how do you deal with the educational piece? Because education is so often this sort of in-person piece, but it is so important, particularly in getting young people involved and also in correcting some of the historic imbalances in our audiences. Our audiences are too white, too monoculture, too old, right? And we want to retain all those people who have always supported this art, but we want to also understand our own deficiencies in the past and invite people in, change our companies, change the, uh, the racial, ethnic uh, mix of the performers and also of the audience members. How do you deal with the education piece, uh, Dale? Are you putting some of that content online as well? Uh, we are, and, and quite frankly, that's the more nimble part of the organization right now, just because of in-hall activity, testing of musicians, programming. So we, you know, we've got the, our Nagani Music Institute, which is our, our, the name for our music education community, all of our programs under one big, wonderful umbrella there. So uh, through the summer, that was one of the things we decided early on, no matter what, even when it looked like we were going to lose the fall season for sure, we were going to change the programming and get creative with our institute programs. So we started a couple of new series. We have something called CSO for Kids, which are children's books, which have been animated with working with Chicago Children's Theater, narrated with musician playing music behind it. So product lines that we could effectively use to share with school systems, library, the libraries were excited to have these in the city and just make them free to everybody on the website. So things like that, we've got the Civic Orchestra, which is also in our Nagani Music Institute. So they are also doing programming and teaching methods for school teachers that are working with young students in music programs. So we're basically trying to stay very mission focused still, just delivering it in a very different way. And strangely enough, you know, we had planned on some pretty good fundraising setbacks this year with no onstage activity probably happening. But it turns out, you know, this stuff is very attractive. The donors have been incredibly supportive because a lot of this takes new technology for us. You know, we launched a whole new platform we call CSO TV, um, where we put most of this virtual content. But we needed, we needed, you know, better equipment, like everybody, the increased platform. So donors, donors have been very supportive of this for the purpose of getting, keeping the Institute programs live in a different way and active. Um, same thing for the digital concerts we're recording. But yeah, I think this, this content has been really important because it's also let us focus this year on informing donors more about all the things we've always done in the community. But when you're such a world famous orchestra like this is, that the orchestra obviously garners a lot of attention because it's truly spectacular what it does, but we're also all these other things in the community. So it's been a good chance this year for us to showcase that and talk about it more. And Danielle, you have different challenges when it comes to education. You have a ballet school. You also have a school that, that trains your, your, your future uh, stars on stage. And those are associated but different functions. And it's very difficult when you're talking about a physical instead of an oral um, discipline mm -hmm. to uh, provide the same kind of virtual experience. How are you confronting the educational piece that is so important to uh, the engagement of the community? Yeah, it's a great question. And I feel like everything Dale said, you could insert San Francisco Ballet and it's the same story, right? So, so we have our San Francisco Ballet School where those classes all went virtual over the summer. We have seen the dedication of our young people who are on their path to their dream where they, will, they are at their, their bar in their either kitchen or their living room or their bedroom and they're on Zoom. Um, and with our education outreach into the schools, it's a little different. 
um, San Francisco Unified School District, and there's a lovely TV show they launched in the spring called San Francisco Loves Learning. And San Francisco Ballet was invited to have a, a spot every day. So I think uh, there's been maybe 80 episodes. Uh, and talk about scrappy, nimble. They basically have their iPhones, they're in their kitchens. They, they're making very innovative, very um, engaging content for kids. And it's hard because our, our dance in schools and communities, we're in our 41st year. And um, at San Francisco Ballet, we love acronyms. So it's called DISC. So to an outsider, they read, you know, San Francisco's DISC. And DISC is something you throw or di what is DISC? So we're learning that, ah, we actually actually to tell people what this means. And <laughs> they hear that we've been doing it for 41 years. And it's, um, it's thrilling to know the commitment from our education and training teams, just that no matter what, they were going to continue serving those children in the Title I schools in, in the city. You know, it's so interesting. And by the way, uh, viewers, if you have any questions, please use the, uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get those in. Um, we just completed a poll in which we asked whether uh, COVID is going to uh, change the landscape here. And I think you're describing how it is and you're indicating that this change, um, which is an advance, right? It is a benefit. This change is going to sustain beyond that. About 90% of the people felt that, that the change was going to be sustained. 10% uh, felt that, that things were going to snap back. We're asking a, a, another question, which is about uh, fundraising. Um, in terms of fundraising, just, just to get uh, uh, your answer on this, in terms of fundraising techniques, the actual nuts and bolts and the workflows and the systems, Danielle, that you use, mm -hmm. is that going to shift in, in fundamental ways uh, going forward in your experience? We're taking a poll right now, so we're kind of anticipating the answers. We have uh, quite a few respondents already. So before the poll ends, I'm just going to ask you, does, will this be a sustained change and will you add to your tool set? Uh, absolutely. So we decided to use a, a microsite, a platform that's not on our website, that's not related to us at all called Classy. Um, and we, it looks, if, when you go to our site, which I think we'll share um, after this um, call, right. um, you would never know you're not on the San Francisco Ballet website. Um, it has allowed us to go more grassroots. Uh, there's a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising function. And back with our relief fund, where we crested $5 million, we had musicians, dancers, board members, staff, all fundraising on behalf of the organization. That is something San Francisco Ballet had not done before outside of the board, right? Because that's what the board of course does and does well. Um, so we've taken the learnings and it's allowed us, I feel to be more creative, to be more nimble. And I say to my staff, if we're going to fall off the ladder, let's not fall off the bottom rung. Like if we're going to fall, let's like, let's, let's, let's try these new things. And um, so far, knock on wood, it's worked exceptionally well. So I think technology is our friend. I think um, changing things because we've always done them, like this is the time, there's no excuse not to. And, and Dale, are you finding that, that, um, that there are techniques that you've never used before, you've never considered? I mean, in, in, in terms of what Danielle was saying, I had had a conversation with a very renowned artistic director and I had proposed, this was just before the pandemic, I had proposed allowing this person's artists to connect with their social media group and provide some insight into what they were doing on a daily day-to-day day, day -day basis. And I, this, this artistic director, who's world renowned, just sort of laughed at me, said, there's no way I'm going to ever allow that, Mark. Uh, you're crazy, you know, I like you, I respect you as a search consultant. But you know now what what Danielle is is describing is exactly what what is is happening in this particular case. How are you uh, dealing with it, Dale? Are you are you seeing a sustained change? Uh, of course, yeah. So on top of just the technical data systems, as Danielle outlined, you know we're doing that same kind of thing as well. But uh, using the technology to we're trying to create what we call those lobby experiences for for donors and patrons of all levels. So we're, we're getting donors, small groups of our different donor categories together with the musician or their friends um, to have these little Zoom conversations with just a little musical topic, but mainly for them to socialize a little bit like they do. And right now we're in this um, two week period right now that's our normal patron, subscriber, donor appreciation weeks. 
So the marketing department is doing that in large scale. They're, they're, putting, they're offering some of these Zoom events, but they're actually pairing people into little Zoom rooms based on the night you subscribe. Like if, if you're a Thursday A series, we've grouped them together because you see each other in the lobbies and the hallways and outside of the box seats or the concession stands. That's so cool. we're, we're trying to keep people together to feel that social experience. And I would say one thing, because we're all aggressively trying to push our digital products and our, we call them CSO sessions and our digital concerts, those are great and people are enjoying those, but we have to be really honest as we assess the impact. People aren't so much missing content as much as they're missing the personal experiences. So everyone and their dog is putting out great digital content and ours is magnificent. Um, but I think people can see a lot of that as well every day, everything we do. Um, but we're trying to create some of those experiences you're missing, which is a little bit of socializing where we can and so forth. Um, but I, I was thrilled um, to make all this happen. I was thrilled to hear Danielle talk about what a good marketing partnership they've had there with development because gosh, we all know, and Danielle, you and I have worked in a lot of similar type places and even similar cities. We know what our colleagues, I mean, we know that development marketing rub, it's just, it's a natural hard edge sometimes. Um, and even right now, I'm, I'm on a lot of these calls, I'm hearing colleagues often talking about there's almost little communication or they're still very siloed. Here, are they, the marketing team is, I mean, we're practically one and the same with them. They're actually creating some of the product that we're using for fundraising things and vice versa. Um, we've got people from both departments that work every couple of days together on these teams to move messaging back and forth quickly right now to engage donors and patrons. We're sharing donor benefits with what would typically be marketing patron things in a separate. Um, so working together with the marketing team has been just absolutely critical to our big success this past year and now um, because they've got the tools to do a lot of that and the graphic designers and the thinking in that regard. So uh, yeah, I don't know how places that haven't conquered that are, are gonna fare in this because look, this is also on top of all of this, it's change, change, change every right. day. And so, yeah, I'm just so thankful that the marketing team, team here in Chicago has been so creative and such fantastic partners. So we've had a couple of uh, questions. Um, we were asked about the links to donate and you both are welcome to answer that on the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of the screen. And we'll also write everybody afterwards who have registered to the Zoom call um, about those links. We'll get that from both Dale and from Danielle. Um, we were also asked a couple questions about sort of the microsite classy, Danielle, since you mentioned it. Um, could you just talk about how people can um, can start what you've already completed. And, um, and then maybe if, if people want to uh, connect with you, I'm, I'm sure you're, you'd be ha happy to share some of that knowledge. But could you just describe how you got started uh, with that so that uh, others can take advantage of, of your experience? Yeah, I, I actually, I can't actually say enough about how that works so beautifully. Um, I, when we decided we had to raise some money really quickly and we knew we wanted to be the first, like we wanted to be out the gate as fast as humanly possible. So we looked at, uh, you know, GoFundMe and a number of things and then Classy, somehow somebody had shared it with me kind of in the past. And so I said, well, just take a peek at that. So my staff did their incredible due diligence we signed the contract, uh, we worked with marketing again, so it's fully, it's fully fleshed out. You would never know it's not our site. And um, we launched it. It was primarily driven by social, right? Mm -hmm. By social media, by email. We did very little um, USPS mail. Uh, we did do one uh, fiscal year end piece in June, but the rest has all been digital. So we saved a pile of money. And something interesting with the Classy platform is when folks make their gift, they can, uh, we, we pre-checked or populated the box that said, I want to cover the, um, the fees associated. Um, and it was 85% of people covered their processing fees. So we're actually like even further ahead of the game than we would have been had we been processing in-house. Oh, that's um, a great point. It's a great yeah, point because it doesn't erode um, your purpose, which is to make sure money flows to artists. Yeah, exactly. So our first... Our, our initial plan was simply to use it for the relief fund and call it a day, but you sign a contract, it's one year. So we're like, huh, here we are six months in, nine months in. 
Um, so we actually just um, kind of wiped it and we, we launched a Nutcracker fundraising microsite. And um, back to the, the educational piece, and there, there are some communities that we've served very, very well throughout the holiday season, notably boys and girls clubs here in San Francisco. And the thought of that disappearing this year was troubling. So this goes back to what Dale had mentioned about marketing and development in that partnership and the blurred line. Um, so Nutcracker brings San Francisco Ballet about $9 million per year. Um, that $9 million per year allows us to do a whole lot of stuff. It's, you know, typically our budget's 55 million. And um, we decided that we were going to go forth because we do have an HD capture that was um, done back in 2007. It's of this current production. And we were gonna go forth and try to monetize it as best we could, either through licensing or ticketing. And uh, my events team, you know, they have their ear to the ground. There's very creative people who work in the events world in San Francisco, probably in the world. And we were given a demo of this virtual immersive world. So imagine when you go to a realtor's website and you take a virtual tour of someone's home. We have done that with the War Memorial Opera House. So you will go to the front. We've created snow, which of course it doesn't snow here. At least I don't think it does. <laughs> uh, we've decorated it for the holidays with nutcrackers and trees and garlands. And uh, there are, I think there are seven activities so you, you pay $49 or subscribers get a discount, it's $39. And you can go all around our opera house. You then watch the HD capture when you enter the auditorium. And then there's a kind of fantastical backstage. That, that's something the ballet has never done. Like this is so out of our, I'd say comfort zone. Um, and it launches the day after Thanksgiving and we've sold a lot of tickets. And we're now doing virtual corporate holiday parties from tech companies that we have never been able to get a foot in the door with. So That's it's everybody's happy. The board's happy. Staff's happy. Dancers are happy. Donors are happy. Well, it also, it also talks about, talks to the question of how do you create the art and the arts environment uh, in this virtual world to, to connect to new audiences. Um, and, and, you know, we were asked a, an interesting question by uh, Wafa uh, Kanan, which is uh, really about, and it's, 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 a, it's an issue that's near and dear to our heart, in that the people who can attend these performances need to at least be able to afford a ticket very often. And that ticket price is fairly high for certain people. So you basically exclude a whole amazing array of individuals and very often uh, people with the lower income uh, spectrum, uh, often because of the way our society works, people of color. Um, are you thinking about partnerships, online partnerships that allow people to experience your art who often, because of imbalances in our society, are excluded from the audience, Dale. And, and how, do you, how do you use these platforms uh, to connect in ways that start to engage people in this wonderful classical music that, incidentally, they are hearing on video games, right? They are seeing on Netflix shows, sure. right? I mean, composers are replete. I mean, if you, if you go to any popular culture, you see these amazing, amazing works, but you don't get to experience them orally because you're in the moment of the film, but they're, but they're there, they're all over the place, aren't they? Yeah, and this, this is a great tie into two topics that are important here, which is, uh, you know, digital content, but also this notion of special events, virtual special events. Um, we, are, we are recording now a weekly series of concerts curated specifically for smaller ensembles right now, because that's what we can do in our city. Um, but they're they're highly well produced, and we're st we're streaming those every week, and they stay up for thirty days, and then we go into the next week. Um, but so one of the things that's happened, not just during the pandemic, but in, in general, um, like I said, when we started out, it was just people playing a few things in their kitchen, and we loved it. We were so starving to see our CSO players, just our friends, play something, and that was great. Now the standard has gone up a lot. So to your point, Mark, too even whether it be ballet, theater shows, concerts, everyone says, well, just throw some cameras back there and tape it all and throw it out. You can't, you gotta, you know, these things we see on PBS, great orchestra concerts or, you know, musicals done with, um, those things can take hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce at that level. 
and people expect to see things with perfect lighting and camera angles. And um, that is really hard to do on a regular basis, unless again, you invest in the equipment, the technique, the producers, post editing is killing all of us, I'm sure. It's taking twice as long, three times as long as we all imagined um, because it's really good quality stuff and it, you know, editing and it takes a while. Plus to edit, to edit for a symphonic performance or to edit for a dance, it takes a specialist. So now you're talking about staffing in different ways, plus you need technologists. So you've got, you're really talking about a transformation of the organization, aren't you? Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, I mean, score matching and, you know, cameras don't record audio, the audio is someplace else, it'll all be matched, pieced together. Um, but, but yeah, so I think, I think doing more of that is exciting. I think how this will impact our future, I think we're finding great benefit from doing a lot of this. And we want to find ways to keep doing it when we're back. Because as we all know, the year we come back for us, probably FY22, um, it may take a long time for audiences to come back in full. So everyone says, well, just we'll do both. We'll do live and we'll just broadcast it. Well, again, you can't just broadcast it. You have to produce it if you're going to do it. So that's that's what we're we're all wrestling with. But I did want to say to to the for us, we just did our Sounds of Celebration Gala, Symphony Ball, we call it, um, a few weeks back. Um, and we decided it was going to be, you know, a major fundraiser for us. And we fortunately we had a nine hundred thousand dollar goal and we we hit about almost 920,000. So we're thrilled with that. But we decided at the time we did it, we were gonna make it free um, to the world. We were just gonna put it on our website. Everyone can see it. You can still see it now for a year. Um, and it was really well produced. Um, but because of the moment, we couldn't record the large orchestra. So we did some smaller performances, but we used this year to talk about all the things this orchestra is to Chicago and to its community. So it's, um, it's the first time the gala has really featured heavily all the education and outreach programs we do and major performances and the maestro. Um, so, you know, that was a good case of really using the technology to do something we've been wanting to do for a while, which is really remind this community of all the things we are for it. And it's a good time in a pandemic to reinforce why we're, we think we're a cultural treasure in Chicago for these many reasons that we're gonna show you now. And a more democratized outreach. So Danielle, we're coming to the end of our time. I'm gonna give you the last word. Um, could you just describe what you feel the future is? And by the way, I just wanted to mention, we just completed a poll, very interesting results. We asked people to uh, pick three out of six choices of some of the ways, some of the best ways that performing arts orgs can raise earning attributed revenue. Um, the uh, top vote getter was to have online fundraising events. And Dale, you were talking about that. Danielle, you were talking about using different technology. Uh, the second choice was uh, more live uh, online performance on hosted channels. And then the third uh, area of agreement uh, seems to be uh, using social media. So there's, there's an awful lot of emphasis here of, of using these, these different ways to bring people into contact, um, social contact, as you described, uh, Dale, the whole issue of, of using services and shared platforms to engage and then to raise money, Danielle. So this is a crackable code, right? We can do this in the performing arts, can't we? Oh, absolutely, clearly. I mean, we're, we're on that path. So with our relief fund, we saw that 12% of the donors were not from California. So that for us was, that was a moment. We're like, huh, that's interesting. We didn't mail any letters out. So 12% of these people are from far, far away. And assuming that translates to our digital season, if you think about, you know, the thought of driving to San Francisco, going downtown, parking your car, going to the opera house, it's beautiful. But why can't the world be kind of more like sports? where you can watch the, I don't know my sports team, 49ers on TV <laughs> for some days that you might say, I'm going to go drive and go to the stadium, enjoy it live. Like my dream would be that there's always going to be in my world, this digital offering. And then there's, if you want to see it live, join us. So I think it's only positive, only positive. Well, if we go back to, uh, to um, programs like the live broadcast of the honeymooners all those years ago you had a studio audience but really it was the virtual audience all out there in broadcast land and we can all do that now yes it will cost money dale and yes you have to pay attention to 
detail, Danielle, but we can do this. This is a crackable code and with uh, the intelligence of people like yourselves, your organizations and others around the field, we can do this. We can ensure the classic arts thrives. Thank you so much for sharing your story. That's the Nonprofit Report attendees. Thank you for being here. We're gonna go on a bit of a hiatus during the holidays, but we'll be back in January. And we'll also uh, uh, be sending out some information and asking for some advice on how we can shape these programs for the future. Danielle Saint-Germain Gordon of San Francisco Ballet, Dale Heading of Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Thank you so much. Have a great holiday. Stay safe.